Chapter Ten of Joseph, Beloved, Hated, Exalted by F. B. Meyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Ten, Joseph's Administration of Egypt, Genesis Chapter Forty Seven. We see him as he moved. How modest, kindly, all accomplished, wise, with what sublime repression of himself, and in what limits and how tenderly. Tennyson. While all the domestic details on which we have been meditating were transpiring, Joseph was carrying his adopted country through a great crisis. I might almost call it a revolution. When he became prime minister, the Egyptian monarchy was comparatively weak, but after he had administered affairs for some thirteen years, Pharaoh was absolute owner of all the land of Egypt. As it was in England in the old feudal times, so it was in Egypt. All the land became held in fief from the crown. The history of this change deserves more attention than we can give it now, but from first to last it was due to the statesmanship of the young Hebrew. Nor is this the only instance of a Hebrew conducting his adopted country through extraordinary perils by the exercise of extraordinary genius. During the seven years of plenty, Joseph caused one-fifth of all the produce of every district to be hoarded up in its town, so that each town would contain, within immense granaries, the redundant produce of its own district. At last the years of famine came, and recent sad experiences in India will help us to realize something of the meaning of the words, there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. No doubt, had there been no provision made by Joseph, the streets would have been filled by emaciated skeletons picking their way feebly amid the heaps of the dying and the dead. Men, women, and children would have fallen before the scythe of famine fever, and it would have taken years for the country to be repopulated to its former extent. The slender stores of the Egyptians were soon exhausted, and when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Bread, bread, give us bread. Did they invade the palace precincts, flow into the corridors, and force their way into the royal presence, as the Parisian mob has done more than once in the awful days of revolution? We do not know. But Pharaoh had a ready answer. Go unto Joseph, and what he saith unto you, do. Then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. This was right and wise. It would have been a great mistake to give. In the Irish famine the government set the people to earn their bread by making the roads, since it would have done them lasting injury to have allowed them to receive help without rendering some kind of equivalent. And it is not too much to say that it would have taken the Egyptians one or two generations to recover their moral tone if, instead of selling, Joseph had given the corn. Joseph's policy was in exact accord with the maxims of modern political economy. But the money was soon exhausted. It lasted just one year. What was to be done now? There was nothing left but persons and lands. The people were naturally loath to pledge these, but there was no alternative, and so they came to Joseph and said, Why should we die? Buy us and our land for bread. In other words, they became Pharaoh's tenant farmers and paid him twenty per cent, or one-fifth of their returns, as rent. This may seem a heavy tax, but it is not heavier than the rentage in almost every European country in the present day. 1. Let us study the spirit of Joseph's administration. It is summed up in three brief sentences. He was diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Of his diligence in business there is ample proof. When first raised to the proud position of premier, he went out through all the lands of Egypt, the granaries were built and the corn stored under his personal supervision, and when the famine came the corn was sold under his own eye. The whole pressure of arrangements seemed to have rested entirely upon his shoulders. Pharaoh wiped his hands of it and said, Go to Joseph. Joseph gathered up all the money that was to be found in all the land of Egypt. Joseph bought the whole land for Pharaoh, and Joseph superintended the removal of the people into the cities from one end of the country to the other for the easier distribution of food. Joseph made the laws. Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. Young men, 
make joseph your model in this some men do their life work as if every joint were stiff with rheumatism or as if they were exuding some adhesive viscous making their snail progress as painful as it is slow others are somnambulous looking for something and forgetting what they seek not able to find their work or having found it not able to find their tools always late taking their passage when the ship has sailed insuring their furniture when the house is in flames locking the door when the horse is gone beware of imitating any of these first choose a pursuit however humble into which you can rightly throw your energy and then put into it all your forces without stint these are simple rules but most important make the most of your time the biggest fortunes that the world has seen were made by saving what other men fling away so be miserly over the moments and redeem the gold dust of time and they will make a golden fortune of leisure be punctual some men are always out of step with old father time they do not miss their appointments but they always arrive five minutes late it would seem as if they were born late and have never been able to catch up their lost moments be methodical arrange so far as you can your daily work as postmen do their letters in streets and districts subject always of course to those special calls which the almighty may put in your way be prompt if your work must be done do it at once well-earned rest is sweet be energetic an admirer of thomas carlyle met him once in hyde park and broke in upon his reverie with an earnest request for a motto the old man stood still for a moment and then said there is no better motto for a young man than the words of the old book whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with thy might but joseph was also fervent in spirit he was a fruitful bough by a well whose branches ran over the wall it is almost impossible to exaggerate the beauty of this similitude yonder is the scorched land you dare not expect verdure much less fruit suddenly you descry greenery and far-reaching boughs laden with luscious grapes why ah down there lies a deep deep well and the rootlets of the vine go down into those cool depths and draw up a moisture which the torrid heat cannot exhaust joseph's life was spent in a dry and thirsty land there was not much in egypt to nourish his spiritual life yet to its close he bore fruit which refreshed men and pleased god love joy peace long-suffering meekness goodness self-control all these were in him even to abounding and it was no doubt owing to his fervour of heart it is related of a grand vizier who in early life had been a shepherd that he set apart one room in his palace for his exclusive use no one was permitted to enter it it was filled with the simple furniture of his early home and the implements of his humble calling and he entered it each day for quiet meditation on what he had been that he might not be proud so surely in joseph's palace there was a retired room where he spent many hours each week in communion with the god of his fathers to whom he owed everything he had would that more of our business men were fervent in spirit there's too little of this time for the ledger but none for the bible time for the club or society but none for the prayer meeting time for converse with friends but none for god and as the result the bloom soon passes off the spirit and the light dies away from the eyes and the elasticity from the step men get to look wearied tired restless and dissatisfied life bears a sombre aspect and men in this condition are not able to refresh weary souls that pass hard by searching in vain for the rich clusters of refreshing fruit we cannot produce fruit by any efforts of our own we can only be fruitful by sending our rootlets down to the well we must make time for private prayer and for the loving study of the bible then the glow of fervour would never die down in the heart and the leaf would never look sere and seasonable fruit would never be wanting think not that fervour of spirit is impossible to those who live amid the stir of business it was not impossible to joseph it need not be impossible to any who will adopt the simple rules of the bible and of common sense it is not enough to light a fire we must feed it 
and yet how many of my readers have gradually sunk into habits of carelessness in private devotion such as are bound to reduce and extinguish fervour of soul there is the well of god's own word get near it strike deep into it draw up from it by loving habitual study thus shall you be able to resist the insidious agencies that would drain away your enthusiasm and your power but joseph was also a servant of god god was in all his thoughts i fear god was his motto it was not you that sent me hither but god and he hath made me ruler throughout all the land of egypt this was the inspiration of his life in saying that he showed that he felt accountable to god for all that he was and did now we surely need a principle to bind together our daily life and our religious exercises so many live in business on one set of principles and put on another set with their sunday clothes but where is the principle that will bring all our life beneath one blessed rule i know of no other principle than that laid down by the good centurion when he said a man under authority we must feel hour by hour that we are men and women under the authority of the lord jesus christ the law of gravitation rules the sweep of the planets round the sun and the course of a grain of dust in the autumn breeze so obedience in everything to our saviour will simplify and regulate all things and reduce the chaos of our life to one symmetrical and beautiful whole if there is anything in your life any habit any dress any pursuit which christ cannot approve it must be laid aside his name must be written upon all the bells of life or they must cease to ring the apostle invested with new dignity the existence of the poor slaves of his time by saying ye are servants of christ do service with a will not as unto men but as unto christ and it is of no consequence how menial your position is you may do it for your dear lord whispering again and again this is for thee gracious master all for thee what a check this would put on hurried and superficial work there are a good many unfaithful servants about in the world and if you rebuke them you receive as answer my wages are so poor my mistress takes no interest in me i am treated as a slave i shall leave as soon as i can stop who put you where you are had christ anything to do with it if not how came you there without asking his leave if he had how dare you leave unless you are sure he calls you away and as for service why do you serve for money or thanks or habit no for christ then do your best for him every room you enter is a room in his temple every vessel you touch is as holy as the vessels of the last supper every act is as closely noticed by him as the breaking of the alabaster box on every fragment of your life you may write sacred to the memory of jesus christ this would give a new dignity to toil and a new meaning to life let us never forget how the thought of our dear lord will equalize all life and act as the complement of its needs those who are called as free are slaves to him and those who are slaves to men are free in him and all life reaches its true unity and ideal just in so far as he is its head and lord first corinthians chapter seven verse twenty two two notice the confession of the egyptians thou hast saved our lives genesis chapter forty seven verse twenty five what a splendid endowment is coolness foresight presence of mind they are the gift of god and they have enabled many men to be the saviors of their fellows that engineer had it who some time ago turned off the steam from the broken cylinder on the ocean steamer that seemed doomed livingstone and stanley have it among travellers and it often saved them and their followers from infuriated mobs of savages cromwell and wellington had it among soldiers and it enabled them to extricate their men from positions in which death seemed certain cavour pitt and bright have had it preeminently among statesmen any of these might have been addressed in the words of the egyptians thou hast saved our lives but there is something higher than this as i see these egyptians crowding round joseph with these words upon their lips it makes me think of him of whom joseph was but a type 
Joseph lay in the pit, and from the pit was raised to give bread to the brethren who had rejected him, and to a nation of Gentiles. Jesus lay in the grave, and from its dark abyss he was raised to give salvation to his brethren the Jews, and to the millions of Gentile people. Already I hear the sounds of countless myriads, as they fall before the sapphire throne, and cry, Thou hast saved us. The Egyptian name of Joseph meant the Saviour of the world. But the salvation wrought by him is hardly to be named in the same breath with that which Jesus has achieved. Joseph saved Egypt by sagacity. Jesus saved us by laying down his life. Joseph's bread cost him nothing, but the bread which Jesus gives cost him Calvary. Joseph was well repaid by money, cattle, and land, but Jesus takes his wares to the market of the poor and sells them to those who have no money or price. He can supply all our need. His only condition is that he should do it freely. To offer him anything in exchange is to close all dealings with him. But if you are willing to go without gold in your hand, and with an empty sack, he will give without stint, with both hands, pressed down and running over. He will fill the hungry with good things, but the rich he will send empty away. Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. 3. Remark the resolve of these Egyptians. Let us find grace, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Thou hast saved our lives, and we will be thy servants. How could we state better the great argument for our consecration to our Saviour? He has saved us. Ought we not to be his servants? There are many arguments by which we might urge acceptance of the yoke of Christ. There is such dignity in it. The old butler is proud to wear the livery of a ducal house, but what livery is so worthy as that which Christ's servants wear? I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus. There is such happiness in it. It is perfect freedom. To be free of Christ is to grind in slavery. To obey Christ is to go forth into the glorious liberty of the sons of God but I pass by these arguments now to present one more cogent, more pathetic, more moving. It is this. Jesus has saved you. Will you not serve him? These are the successive steps. Mark them well. Recognize that Jesus bought you to be his by shedding his own blood as your ransom price and by giving his flesh for you and for the life of the world. Then give yourself entirely to him, saying humbly, lovingly, trustfully, I do now, and here, offer a present unto thee, O Lord, myself, my soul and body, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice to thee. From that moment you are no more your own, but his. He takes what we yield, at the moment of yielding. Reckon on him to keep you, and to supply all your need." Take Jesus to be moment by moment your Saviour, Friend, and Lord. Yield to Him an obedience which shall cover the entire area of your being and shall comprehend every second of your life. When solicited to leave Him, appropriate the words of the ancient Hebrew slave and say, I love my Master, I will not go out free. He deserves this. For you He lay in Bethlehem's manger. For you He was homeless and poor. For you he sweat the drops of blood and poured out his soul unto death. For you he pleads in heaven. I beseech you then, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves to him living sacrifices, which is your reasonable service. End of chapter 10